as a kid, I always knew I was different because we'd, we would go out. My dad never used to work. He'd have illegal gambling clubs like Spielers. And all my dad's friends were like, you'd always see him in a newspaper or they'd come round and they was all like, all big gold Rolexes, pinky rings. And my dad's friends were like, he had a guy, a scouser called Norman Johnson. And he was like one of my dad's closest friends. Then this guy was, I would say, one of my, one of, one of my favourite of my dad's friends because he had an affair with the Princess of Oman. And he, he, she ran away with him in 1979 with £10 million in suitcases. What? The news of the world blew the story right up. And he wrote a book called Black Eyes and Blue Blood. It's out. It's, it's by Norman Johnson. He died in 2012. But Norman had like the big mansion in Stafford. He had the big gold Rolex, the big eight carat diamond, all the Rottweilers, changed his cars <laughs> like he changed his underwear. And he lived life like, it was in Marbella, New York. And he actually worked with Russell Buffalino, who the film The Irishman was based on. Oh, shit. So he was, growing up as a kid, I knew that, I thought, wow, this is, my dad's friends would go in the pub and everyone would sort of move away from him. They would stood at the bar and, and they would go, oh, get, and they had like a never ending supply of 50 pound notes it would, you'd see them go to the bar mate keep the change and you'd see them all like running around but every, every whenever they sort of pulled the money out everyone would appear and, and everyone else would be stood there like waiting around like in falls I'd just say but I knew that they were different and it was like I used to love being with my dad he had like if he walked in Sean he was like he was mesmerising he, he was like he had these still eyes but he, he had flat nose but very good looking man and he was just he would just walk in he was immaculately dressed but he would treat everyone with respect but everyone you, he had like a, a, a shield around him it was like an aura and I as a kid I was like fucking hell I love this and even my mum and dad's friends like Donald Sutherland the Hollywood actor and like they would come over for, and we'd go for dinner in Langham's but everyone he would be like in awe of my dad and I thought well, hang on a minute you're a big star and Kiefer was like a lot younger at the time he'd just done Stand, Stand By Me which was a really great film and it was like they was like in awe of my dad and I thought fucking hell these are like famous people why are they like that but whenever we was out everyone was always in awe of my dad and I used to say to my dad dad what do you do for a living and he'd go like because the people at school ask what you do for a living he'd say I'm a problem solver son I said what do you mean he went well if someone's got a problem I'll solve it and I said well what do you mean he went well say look someone comes to me suddenly they're having problems with like say like the travellers one day this woman they'd been terrorised by these travellers for years and they'd been trying to nick their land and my dad went down there went into their pub on his own and uh, he, he ended up doing what he had to do and this woman wrote me a letter saying we've been to the police we've been to the courts we've tried to hire people we've got employed you come down in one day and solve it we are so indebted to you but my dad wouldn't take any money from them he said son well, they're a really nice family he said but and they deserved my help but he, he, he could be very nice as well and he wouldn't drink with, he didn't really like the company of other gangsters. He, had, he was partners with Eddie Richardson in the unlicensed boxing, but he chose to drink with the window cleaner. or the. And I said, Dad, why do you drink with those old mugs? And he, he goes, son, they're not mugs. They go to work from nine to five. They look after their family and they're really decent people. He said, but these people, he said, gangsters won't give you nothing. They just take off your take off. They're leeches. He said, see that guy with the window cleaner, you mug off, the poor Harry the window cleaner. He said, he gave me a bit of work and I earned a million pounds. He said, someone, look, <laughs> not ever was, not ever was, I can say that, I'm not implicating my dad, but he, at the time, this this guy's, there was a guy in Norfolk, he's, he, his daughter was going to have a Colombian drug baron. They were storing all their coke in this guy's shed, underneath the shed. Now, this guy got in touch with the window cleaner. He said, do you know anyone who might be, I think it's a load of drugs. He got in touch with my dad. My dad's his son. He said, I didn't move straight away and earned 900 grand out of it. He said, so what gang is going to come to me and tell me he's got a load, a big parcel of fucking get? He said, but he wasn't a drug dealer with that, but he, on this occasion, he moved that from A to B and got his money. Yeah. But he was a, he was a great, as a kid, we would have anything we wanted. My mum was a lot, my mum was nearly 20 years younger than my dad. She was like the glamorous lady, but she was the one who wore the trousers. If my dad was in a pub and she phoned up, he'd go, no, 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 no. And then she'd be straight with his gold spot, straight in his car driving home. You know, like, it was, he was petrified of my mum. But she wore the trousers. Definitely. Yeah, 100%. And aside from, obviously, your dad being a local celebrity almost, what was family life back at home? He was fantastic. My dad, my dad, my dad was a family man. He would come home. We had three Yorkshire Terriers. We had two Rottweilers, and we had a little cat. And we, my dad, my dad would just. He was a, he was a family man. He loved his mum. He'd go and see his mum mauled every single day. She lived in South London. He would go and see her every day. Drop cigarettes off. Sit and have a cup of tea with her. She always used to do tomatoes on toast. But my nan had five sisters and a brother who died in a fire in Canada. So she had lots and lots of family members. So as you went into my man's, all you'd hear is three bell rings. People coming in all day long, every day. Um, in 1978, my dad was working on a film called uh, The Macintosh Man with uh, 
who was the guy, George James Cagney and Edward G. Robinson, I think it was, and he took them both round to his mum's because she loved uh, oh. uh, James Cagney and, and he was on crutches at the time and, uh, he, and my dad was minding him and he took him round to my nan's and it was like the highlight of my nan's life. She had like a picture on which I'm going to put in my dad's book of like, and obviously then my dad knew Frank Sinatra because he'd been working with him since the 50s and Frank had come over and stayed with my dad at Forest Hill where he was living. Did so he, not, was, did did you he know Rod Stewart? Uh, no, we had a, we had a, we had a funny a running with Rod Stewart in Langham's. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> we was we was in Langham's one day. My dad had the back to his back to him, and uh, one of we was making a lot of noise. And uh, obviously, my dad and all his friends. I was on Lauren Perrier Rose. They caused it a big, and it, my dad was smoking a big. He always smoked big cohibas. and uh, there was loads of smoke, and you could see Rod, Rod's missus was getting a right arm, and then he's, 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 he's and he's like kicking, and he's like all like done up like a little tart and uh, and he's and uh, the mind the mind that went over to the table but sort of as my dad turned around he looked at my dad went over to the table he went around, like that moved his hands a bit, and then they got up and left straight away and that's when I thought fucking hell and I knew Rod Stewart was and obviously then my dad would say to me well I said I'm going up London then I'm 17 I want to go to a club he went I'll go see my pal Lenny at the Hippodrome or, or Johnny Johnny Madden at Stringfellas so every time I used to go there, I didn't want to like do it Sean but I'd go to the, one day I went is there Lenny about mate the two great big bruises on the door and they went who, who wants to know, mate? I said, oh, it's Jimmy Tippett, uh, Junior. It's Jimmy Tippett's son. He went, two seconds. Next thing you know, Lenny come bowling over. Like, he's a <laughs> massive lump, Lenny. And he's got his fingerless gloves. So he went, come in, young Jim, come in. He said, but you drop these fucking herbits out you with me. He said, don't you hanging around with these c- I was throwing my language, but no, and then I've had to sit down in a side of bar, and he took me all the way home after Sean. It was so it did have its good things, but also all the doormen would sit there and watch me all night long. You know, like because obviously they're my dad's friends, and they didn't want anything. I'm doing if I was in the toilet with another man, I mean, you're not taking drugs, are you? You're not up to no good. I thought, fuck it, I, I, I didn't know I wanted to, I didn't know I fuck, couldn't, couldn't do it. <laughs> but no, it was uh, fantastic growing up like that. And obviously, my mum, my mum and dad had loads, their friends sort of, we used to go to Marbella, we'd go to Freddie Foreman's club, which was Eagles up in Port Benoose. And that was like, that was my first introduction to cocaine, really, because they used to have bowls of like probably four or five ounces of coke with playing cards stuck in them. And everyone would just like take a little bit and or go off to the toilet and have a, and all the women are walking about in shoulder pads, like sung out of Dallas. And all the guys have got like, like, like sung out of Miami Vice with those snow socks on, with the white trousers and the white shoes and the big Rolexes on. And that for me, that was my friends at school, their mums and dads were like builders and you'd see them driving their normal cars at our house. You'd see Ferraris outside and Range Rovers and Rolls Royces and all these characters coming in and out. And then, we'd, and then what, the next week, you see one of me, the mum and dad's friends in the paper who just gone, gone down on our robbery or killed someone. And you think, oh, but they was all right. They was like, it was, it was, that was normal life. Yeah. It was very similar to, I'd say, an English version of Goodfellas. Yeah. Very, very that, similar. That first line of coke then, did you get hooked on it or was it just... I was, do you know what it was, Sean? I was really, I was, I was just about to get really into going to, go into the boxing in a big world. Frank Warren was signing me up with Sports Network. And I and I, I was working with some uh, well-known gangsters in South London who were like friends of my dad's, my dad's friends' sons. And we used to go to a place called Charlie's Wine Bar, which was like, I think I remember Peter Bleaks, he's saying, if the roof would have fallen in that night, 90% of South London's underworld would have been oh, gone. Yeah. You had like Tony White from the Brinks Mat robbery. You had the Arifs. You had uh, Johnny Fleming, who was on a Security Express robbery, who got extradited back. All big, big names. Jimmy Brand, you had all massive, massive players in South London, all the Peckham firm, the Wild Bunch, they used to call them, because as they'd come in, they'd, they'd normally leave someone dead in the toilets or, or the half dead. They were like really evil people. But uh, I loved it. I was like a kid, like a sponge, just soaking up all this. I was like, fucking hell. And I remember I didn't touch nothing. I didn't even drink. I didn't even have a drink. I was drinking sparkling water. And I used to end up driving a lot of them up to the clubs in London. They'd go, they'd bung me a few quid. And then one day he gives me, oh, please have a line, Jim, have a line. I remember like, he was chopping it up and I could you get that smell of it. It's like, it smelled like paint stripper. And I was like, fuck, I'll, I'll just do a little tiny bit, do a little tiny bit. I remember thinking, wow, that's fucking, oh, no, I was chatting away, I'm fucking chatting away for the, the, the fast as anything. But I was like, oh, this is great. But then I would just sort of get myself a little half a gram and then the next week it would go to a gram and then it would be an eighth. And then I was got into the E's, which with that, for me, when I was 19 doing the E's, they was just like the white doves of 91. And for me, when I had that first half a dove, I was like, I never danced in my life and I had my hands on the, the banisters in limelight in the church. And next thing, I mean, legs are fucking doing their own little thing and I'm thinking, fucking hell. And then the next week, I'm with Nigel Ben on the, on the, on the, in the VIP bit, we're on the fucking balcony, like rocking away on these E's. I'm thinking, oh, this is great. And I saw someone who I'd fucking hate at school and I'm like, oh, what the hell are you going? Come and have a drink, come and have a drink. And this to me was like, this was like, this was the best thing that had ever happened in my life. And then I started getting involved in selling them. I mean, I, I was getting them 
I remember I was paying, what was I paying? I was getting them cheap at the time for like just over five quids, but they would fluctuate like between 20, they used to go up to 25 pences. And I was knocking about £5.50 on the thousand. And I was like doing 10,000. A lot of my friends who were doing raves, they would come down and buy them off me in bulk. And it was like brilliant. It was like, I was thinking, fucking hell, at the weekends, I had a Mercedes Cosworth, a little midi gold Rolex. <laughs> I thought I was like fucking Al Capone. I was like, yeah. I thought, honestly, I thought I had loads of money stashed everywhere. A flat in the Isle of Dogs. Yeah. I was like fucking not even 20. My mates at school were going to work for like 10 grand a year. I was earning that a week. <laughs> and I'm thinking, but I would then spend most of that and I'd be like in a drug induced state from Thursday to the Monday. And then it'd be like working all week to just get back to Thursday and then restock and then go back again. It was just like, it was just like a drug, mental drug craze. But the ease, that definitely was like, they, they, I had some great times. We had Andrew Pritchard on. Was he involved in your e-dealings? Do you know what it was? <laughs> I, 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 Dave, Dave Courtney was doing all the, all the raves at the scene at the time. He used to put, Dave was always, he was the head doorman at Lima. I caused him havoc to be truthful. He, he, he used to suffer a lot. We was in there one night and there was a big fight between the Adamses uh, over North London, who I know. And you had uh, my lot in South London, but they, the South London lot got the better this particular night. And there was blood. It, there was a, uh, it was at, uh, you know, like felt wallpaper. I can't remember what they used to have in Indian restaurants. They, they had that in the limelight VIP bit, but it was blood all up the walls. Yeah. And I went back to limelight a few weeks later, and Dave went, Jim. He said he pulled me to say, went, Jim. He said, it's come orders from above. They don't want you in here because of what happened that night. It's blood. I said, well, what do you mean they blame me? He said, well, you're the one being recognised the most. I thought, fuck, I'm 19 years old. He said, but the orders of above had said like they didn't want me in limelight nightclub because obviously there had been a, a massive, massive gang fight. But then obviously, obviously, we, then we used to go to Legends in Old Berlin Street. We would, my dad, mum and dad's friends owned the WAG club, so we would go, I never spot, we'd always go to other clubs. But no, Dave was very much on the scene at the time. But we, we really, we, I, obviously, then Dave was, my dad was very fond of Dave. And at that point, had you had a brushing with the law? Yeah, no, I'd had a few brushes with the law. I'd, I'd been off for fighting and like silly things as, as you do as, as a youngster. I mean, at school, I got arrested for taking a, like an air pistol to school. It's silly things. What? And an air pistol. You know, yes. like, like an air gun. Say, I wouldn't consider that bad, but obviously today it's very, it, it, it's bad, isn't it? It's always it's going to lead to this and lead to that. But no, I did. I, I wasn't. I was more a fighter at school because obviously boxing was in my genes with my dad and that. So my dad was a very famous boxer, but then he went hooky with Mickey Duff because my dad won his first twenty professional fights, which in the fifties was unheard of. No one done that. He won twenty straight fights and had sixteen knockouts. Wow. Now to to do that, even in this day, you would have a British title fight on your fifteenth fight. So all my dad's was going on a date with Joan Collins on his 21st, on his, on his 21st fight, he was going on a date with Joan Collins, who Richard Attenborough, my dad's friends, set him up with, because they was friends, they lived in Greenwich at the time, and my dad was boxed out of Greenwich, and they, my dad said to me, oh, son, he said, I was getting 15 quid a fight, so you're talking about 1954, 55, he, he said, son, I, I'm like, I know it would have been, it'd been about 53, and he said, he said, son, he said, I was going on a date this night, and then Mickey Duff said to me, if you go down in the third round, I'll give you 175 quid. Now my dad said, you imagine I'm going on a date with a beautiful actress, he said, I can go with 15 quid or I can go with 100. He said, 15 quid wouldn't still pay for night. He said, but having 175 quid in your pocket in the 50s is like, it's like you going out with 10 grand in your pocket. I said, he said, so what would you do? And you haven't, he said, and boxing wasn't like, yeah. he, he, my dad didn't sit that he was fighting under three different names, my dad. So he put, he put a man in a coma in Wales once and give a dodge. He was fighting under a different name because back then you could only fight so many fights a month. So my dad was obviously, they were skin and his family, his, his dad was had poor of his lungs through working as a plasterer. So my dad said, he was looking after the whole family. So my dad said, I, I, I was fighting under three different names just to go and put food on the table, son. He said, so this one particular night, he put the guy in a coma. The guy looked like he was going to die. So then my dad had to give his real name. He was held all night in Wales, in Swansea. But it, obviously it was a very, very tough sport back then. People don't realise. People weren't boxing for like what they are now, for like, it's like a business or they were boxing for like endorsements and sponsorship. Back then it, you was fighting to put food on the table. It was a total different sport to what it is now. And it was a lot harder then. So it obviously was imprinted in your genes. Yeah, because obviously my granddad was a bare knuckle fighter. His dad was a bare knuckle fighter. They was called the Fighting Dyers of Lucian. And it's, I've obviously been researching this for my dad's book. So I paid a, a boxing historian £250 to come up with all my dad's fight, fight career. So he's come up with a great big folder for me. It's brilliant. So I've just given that to the woman who's writing my dad's book, <clears throat> Julie Shaw. She's a number one crime writer in the North. She's written like 20 number one bestsellers. Were you her? Yes. She's yes. a very, very big writer. Yeah, she's like the Martina Cole of the North. Oh. So obviously I still have, obviously where I've been sort of, uh, me and Paige uh, been together a year yesterday. So we've sort of, I've, I've been sort of, we've been enjoying our life. So I've got to knuckle down in the new year 
and, and put, put, put my dad's book together. How did your mum and dad meet? Uh, my dad had a nightclub called The Westerner in Peckham. So, which was like, it was a wild house. So my dad might run the security team there. You had a, my, one of my dad's close friends was Georgie Cooper. No, no relation of Henry Cooper. He played Jack Nicholson's minder in the Batman film. Mm. The big bald guy who carries the, the stereo belt with a big handlebar moustache. <laughs> well, George was like, they, so they had their own door team there. My dad, it was my dad's club uh, with Joey Collier, a scrap metal guy from Peckham. And uh, my mum was one of the waitresses, but she said she couldn't stand my dad. She said, oh, he was a bit old because he was a lot older than my mum. But my dad said, she said he sort of grew on her because my mum was like young, petite, blonde. And she goes, oh, he used to get on my nerves a little bit, Jim. And then my dad was like, and he, he kept trying and trying. I think after seven months, she said, I finally went on a date with him and he told me he had a penthouse flat. She said, I didn't know it was a fucking top floor council flat in Forest Hill. <laughs> with all birds shut up the windows and he still had his ex-girlfriend living there. But they, no, but they ended up they ended up getting well. My dad's, my dad's, everyone's given them six months. When they first got together, they said, no, six months, six months. But my dad, they, my mum, they, they lasted until my dad died of dementia, which was in uh, October 20th, 2016. Wow. And then my mum died five years ago. She died, she, five years later, she died. She was only 73. She, my dad was in his 80s, late 80s. And uh, my mum was uh, 73. She died last year with terminal cancer. Mm. She had it for a year. And that, Sean, sure, was the sort of wake up point in my life. I was going out still doing trade, still at it and doing bits and pieces. But my mum died. So I moved back home to my mum and she sort of started talking to me, telling me stories, just saying, look, Jim, I'm, I, I want to leave you all my money because my sister's had a lot of money herself. She didn't need the money what my mum had. And my mum said, look, can't you just li listen about life? She, she told me so much knowledge. And to this, I actually have listened to everything she said. And I spent that year with her and she died in a nursing home. She was actually bringing her own excrement up in her mouth. Mm. And she, 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 wouldn't, she wouldn't take any... Uh, she wouldn't take any uh, tablets, no medication. She went out on her terms. She she ate what she did. Her belly used to get inflamed. They used to have uh, these uh, these nurses come around, Macmillan nurses, and mm. they used to have to inject her stomach to, you know, to take it down. But she wanted to eat what she wanted. She was smoking. She'd have a glass of Laurent Perrier every couple of days. Mm. She'd done it on her terms. And then I, I, I always thought she was, she was such a strong lady. And it really, she, even to this day, I still, even when I do... I think about things, what my mum told me, and I know they're looking up over me and I do want to do the best of my life now. I've, I've dropped out all the toe rags, all the criminals. They're, they would never, there's no honour amongst thieves, Sean. You know, listen, these people, these people would grass you and do bad things. Mm. All this, they don't touch women and children. They're, listen, these people have got no morals. The real people, the people going to work nine to five and look after their families, they're the real heroes. They're the, and the people, the nurses, they're the real unsung heroes. And I want to be a straight worker now, earn a straight pound though, go on lovely holidays with my girlfriend. I want to be with my girlfriend all the time and make and have lovely meals and enjoy life <laughs> so growing right, up so. growing up was it just you and your sister yeah my sister carrie yeah she's two years younger than me she married a a, a north london uh, guy so she's uh, she's she was she she went over the other side and my mum said she went oh she went over that side but no she had a beautiful wedding uh they had a uh, terry adams wife was there ruth uh, a lot of the uh, notorious characters from North London were there, but yeah, no. So they got uh, they got married, but but it was my mum wasn't really close with my sister's sister. She was my sister was. Uh, I don't want to say it sound a bit bitter or twisted towards my sister because she's we haven't spoke since my mum. Uh, done a will because obviously I got left uh, three quarters of the of the will, and my mum's reasons were because I didn't have really anything. But I I'd been a son when she was dying. I was there every single day when she was dying for a year. When my sister went over three times, which I think personally I shouldn't. I'm disclosing this now. I think it's disgusting. As a daughter, she I think it's disgusting how she treated my mum, and then she expected to have all that money, but she didn't. She wasn't a daughter. But were you close growing up? Protective of older I was always protective if she had boyfriends. I'd always go and punch her heads in if they started or if they dropped her out. I'd always go and beat them up. But no, it, no we wasn't really. I mean, actually, no, we weren't that close. Actually, I remember being at bus stop once. I drove past. I was sitting in with BMW waving at her. And it was like a oh, cold night. You know, we weren't that, no, we weren't that close, actually. No, but no, no. But we were still like, I, I'm more, my mum and dad were sort of big, big characters. And I sort of grew, I, I always wanted to be like my dad, which I could never be. I couldn't be one tenth of the man he was. But I, I, I'm trying my hardest now to be a better person and I, and I like the person I've become.